Tell them it's good to see them this morning. Smile at them when you do it. That's important. Smile. Tell them it's good to see them. Quickly, let me make some announcements. Today, right after service, um, the youth have a bake auction. I think, I think they actually baked a lot of the stuff, didn't they? Yeah, so the youth baked it. So it's a bake auction. So we'll have fun right after service in the back. All the funds are going to help them go to North American Youth Conference. So make sure you stick around and help them. Tomorrow is prayer from 7 to 8. Tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. is 3 a.m. If you're in the 3 a.m. group, we're meeting tomorrow night at 6.30. Tuesday morning, 9.30, ladies' devotion and the Thanksgiving dinner. Our annual church Thanksgiving dinner is at 6.30 p.m. And a program. The daycare is doing a program. So if you have not gotten a pan, what we want you to do is bring a side dish. The church is going to provide, I don't know, mashed potatoes and noodles and meat and all of that. And everybody's going to bring a side dish. But you can't bring your little 9 by 9 pan. Okay? You can't bring your little 9 by 9 baking dish. You have to see Sister Patty White and get... A real pan. And she has disposable pans that you can bring whatever side you're going to bring. See her today. Get a pan and be here Tuesday night at 6.30. Thursday, and we want everybody to come. Bring somebody with you. Bring a friend. Bring somebody. We've got about 70, 80 people from the daycare that have already registered that are going to come. So that's awesome. We'll have a big crowd, all right? And then there's no service Thursday because it's Thanksgiving. If you don't have a turkey, if your, fam if your family cannot get a turkey or a Thanksgiving meal, I want you to see me today. You can do it privately. You don't have to stand in front of everybody. You don't have to raise your hand. Right now, I'm not asking you to raise your hand. But I want you to have a good Thanksgiving meal. So if you can't, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, I need to know and I want to help. We want to help you. The church wants to help you. We want to help you have a good Thanksgiving meal. So please let me know, all right? And uh, I think that's all the announcements we're going to give to the little ones. They're going to march, do the penny march, give uh, a little bit of cash to the little ones, and they'll march up and put it in these jugs as we start morning worship. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. 
There is no one else like you. Lift him up. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. You can be seated. The ushers are going to come and wait on you for a for our Sunday morning tithe and offering. Well, it's cold outside. It's a slow Sunday. One more announcement that I need to make. I didn't make. Uh, first off, we've got our two newlywed couples here this morning, the Harpers and the Longs, y'all are prime timers now, you are prime timers now, and uh, so your church Christmas party is December 1st at Ashley and Adrian Obando's house at 5 p.m., there's a sign-up sheet in the Welcome Center and you need to see Ashley as to what to bring. Uh, get involved in prime timers. You're old married folks. Have you bought your rocking chairs yet? You're old married folks now, and so there is a prime timers event that you'll want to go to. We're going to take up our tithe and offering. The Lord will bless you if you give. Brother Foster, ask God to bless the offering this morning.
Amen. Give and the Lord will bless you. You are not.
Praise God. He's a worthy God. Amen. Stand with me if you will. It's prayer time. We have several needs uh, that we need to take to the Lord. Brother Bob Harold uh, went back to the hospital a couple of days ago, but they released him yesterday. Just a couple of complications, so we need to continue to pray uh, for a touch to Brother Bob Harold. Sister Harper's here this morning, healing, getting better. Thank the Lord. Amen. Brother Petruzzi is here, hobbling on that foot, but the Lord's good, and, and he's healing up, so thank the Lord. And uh, we need to remember all these requests that are on the uh, screen behind me. Bree's uh, father passed away this week, and um, so we need to remember her family. They haven't completed um, the arrangements yet. We're waiting on a brother to, to get in from out of town. Probably looks like visitation will be Tuesday. Uh, more than likely at Flanner and Buchanan on East Washington Street uh, across from Walmart. So keep Bree and, and her family in your prayers. Remember them. Uh, it's never easy to lose somebody in your family that you love. So let's remember them. How many of you have a special request that you want the Lord to answer this morning? You believe God answers prayer? Yeah. Amen. I believe he answers prayer. Praise God. Let's go to the Lord. God, we love you. We magnify your name this morning, Lord. We lift you up. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be in your house this morning. Your presence, your love, and your mercy. We pray, God, that you touch, meet every need. You're a healer. You're a deliverer, a savior, and a keeper. We ask in the name of Jesus. God, be mindful of every need this morning. Hear every prayer, God, every voice that calls out to you this morning. In the name of Jesus, we believe you and we trust you. Ask, Lord, God, that you'd move in this place, touch hearts and lives, minister to needs today. My God, meet every need in this house, Lord. We believe you. We trust you. We thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus.
a name and it's Jesus. Victory has a name and it's Jesus. The word has a name and it's Jesus. Redemption has a name and it's Jesus. friend we have in Jesus. He's a great friend for all of us. He gave his life to redeem us. We should be thankful. Amen. Please don't uh, let Tuesday just be some passing uh, fancy. Um, it's a big deal for us. We enjoy it. It's a great time for us to get together and uh, break bread, share a meal with family and friends make plans to be here Tuesday night at 6.30. Bring your family and uh, let's come and share a meal and fellowship together. It'll be in the Family Life Center over there and we'll have a great time. Amen. 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 It's good to have everybody here today. Glad for the presence of the Lord that I feel. Glad that everybody stayed after my Sunday school rebuke this morning. And uh, 
I've got a message, I think, for you this morning. If you've got a Bible, turn with me to Psalms 51, verses 1 through 3. I stewed all week about being a pastor and what uh, sometimes, sometime, I guess it's not appropriate. Maybe I don't know whether it is or not. I've never heard anybody really preach a, a message about uh, being a pastor. But um, sometime I'd like to talk to you about what it's like to be a pastor. And uh, just all about what it feels, sometimes what it feels like to just be a pastor, just to know uh, the weight of God. And um, you, you deal with your problems. A lot of times I deal with yours and five other people's all at the same time, sometimes more than five. And um, just... Uh, the reason is because there's a call of God, and if you don't understand the call of God, then you probably wouldn't understand what it's like to be a pastor, but um, it's a call, and it's a burden that you have, and um, everybody here is my family. Everybody here is my family, and I feel a sense of responsibility. Um, even getting up here on a Sunday morning and preaching a message. Well, bless his heart, he studied for an hour and he wrote down a few notes. And uh, Everybody's different. But I do a full, detailed, I, I've got, like this morning, I've got 11 pages of notes. That doesn't mean we're going to be here a while. I zip through them pretty quick. Uh, but I've got 11 pages of notes that are all typed out. I've got some colors, color-coded, you know, that when I'm studying and thinking about it, I think that's where I want to emphasize that. I don't put in there, kick right here. I don't, I don't do that. Or I, don't say, I don't put in there, shout real loud. I don't put in there, put on your preacher voice right here. But I do color-code sometimes things that I feel are of importance. Because the Bible tells us that we have to give an account for every word that we speak. And the um, Bible tells us that we, tells me that I have to give an account to God. I don't want to stand before God and you be able to say, well, Brother Long never told me that I had to live for him. Brother Long never told me I couldn't do that and make it to heaven. Brother Long didn't tell me that I couldn't live half-heartedly and still make it. So there's a lot that goes into it, but that's immaterial. That's not got anything to do with what I want to preach about this morning. But I thought about that stewing on that all week long because I was looking for a deer all week. I'm telling you, Thursday night, the sun sets at 5'11", local time in Arkansas, and uh, I just knew, God, you're faithful. And about five minutes after five, I was sure... I even prayed this, God, let an eight or a ten-point monster buck come crawling out of that woods, lift that back leg and scratch the other leg, turn sideways, bam! My 30 out 6 will drop him right where he stands. But the Lord spared those deer, and not one, not one single deer that was worthy of being shot walked in front of my gun all week long. But I did spend some time all week. I, I enjoyed sitting and uh, listening to birds sing. And when we'd get back in the truck, listen to Zane complain that he didn't see one either. And we had a good time. Romans chapter 51. I've rambled enough. I need to, I've rambled because I've only got 11 pages of notes. Usually I've got 14 to 16. So I thought I'd ramble for just a few minutes. Uh, Psalms chapter 51, verses 1 through 3. I want to talk to you this morning. It's Thanksgiving, so I want to talk to you about the greatest reason to give thanks. The greatest reason to give thanks. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. My sin 
is ever before me. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, give thanks to God, and then smile at him, and you can be seated. How many of you have a real paper-bound Bible with you? A real Bible with leather covers. You got it with you? If it includes a superscript, if it's got a superscript on it, it will explain the contents of Psalms 51. And if it has a superscript, odds are it's going to say, to the chief musician, Sophia's shaking her head, She's, hers has it, hers has it. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone in unto Bathsheba. Can you imagine this morning how humiliating it must have been for David when Nathan the prophet came to him that night? No doubt David had hidden his secret for so long and for so well that David had begun to think that he got away with this horrible atrocity that he'd committed. By now, things have begun to return to some kind of a semblance of normal. And by now, David was doing his best to forget the whole mess, the whole affair. And he was trying to put everything that happened behind him. There's no doubt in my mind, folks, that David had no idea where Nathan was going when the prophet launched into the story about the poor, oppressed farmer that had one little lamb stolen from him by the rich farmer neighbor who had a, a flock full of sheep. I have no doubt that it was genuine anger that was stirred within David as he rose up in his kingly stature and he began to pronounce judgment on the selfish individual. You tell me who it is, Nathan, and I'll go make sure that he pays price for the atrocity that he's committed. But can you imagine this morning how shocked David must have been when the old prophet finally dropped the charade and pointed that bony old shaken finger in the face of the king and said, David, you are the man. And in just a moment, David's anger became guilt. In just a moment, kingly pride was swallowed by utter humility. Can you imagine if the worst thing that you ever did in your life, that one thing that you were hoping was forever lost to time, that one thing that you thought you had successfully concealed, if all of a sudden you were confronted with the knowledge that somebody knows the terrible thing that you did. There's no doubt it was a defining moment in the life of David. It was a moment that King David would never forget. So, so many emotions and so many thoughts and so many feelings must have run through his mind in that moment. On the one hand, he must, surely he was over, overwhelmed by the guilt and the shame, while on the other hand, he felt an utter violation, that, that, that unsettling feeling that his secret was finally out in the open and everybody all of his subjects would know David's sin the thing that he had worked so hard to conceal the prophet said God saw exactly what you did that night all the efforts that David had gone through to hide the thing, all of the scheming that he had, we're going to take uh, him and we're going to send him back to the front lines and we're going to make sure that he's slain by the enemy there. All the sense of false security once the murder of Bathsheba's husband was complete, the flood of relief that came when he was able to add Bathsheba to his harem of concubines and finally feel that he had fully concealed the entire matter that he had, he had done. All of it vanished in that instant. All of it was gone. All of a sudden, he was forced to recognize in the moment that Nathan came before him that he couldn't hide the truth any longer. This morning, I've got to share with you the truth that David learned that night. You can't hide anything from God. 
It doesn't matter how well you conceal a thing. There is always one who knows the truth. He knows all things. He knows the secret things of your life. You might hide it from your husband or from your wife. You might hide it from your parents or from your neighbors. But you can't hide anything from God. You might conceal it from other people. You might successfully hide a thing and feel like you've got away with it. You might think that everything is securely concealed and you may hope that it's forever forgotten. But there is one who sees you when nobody else ever does. He knows what nobody else will ever know. And you can't hide anything from God. He knows the very thoughts and the intents of your heart. Not even the utter darkness can conceal you from from the all-seeing eye of the eternal God. He knows everything that there is to know about you. He knows the numbers of hairs that are on your head. There's nothing that you can hide from God. You might have fooled the pastor. You might have fooled everybody else around you. But you have never fooled God. And in that moment, when Nathan revealed the dreadful truth, David's heart was smitten before God. And there were two courses. Every man at that point can take two courses. And there are two courses that David could have taken. You might say that there are two roads, if you will, that lay before him. Both a blessing and a curse. On the one hand, David could have chosen... To make excuses. He could have continued or tried to continue to cover up the situation. He could have tried to rationalize away his guilt. Well, she was naked on the housetop right across from my porch. On the other hand, he could have thrown himself at the mercy of God. And the Bible lets us know that David, with reckless abandon, chose the latter. He chose the blessing instead of the curse. He chose mercy and forgiveness of God instead of the wrath of God. And the words of the psalmist in Psalms 51 were both in David's spirit on that night of nights when the charade of his innocence was torn from him. And out of the depths of the sorrows of his heart, a heart that was filled with, re with repentance. The words of the psalm flowed from the heart and the mouth of the psalmist when he said, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitudes of your tender mercies, blot out my transgression up to now. David has tried to hide his sin, but now in the face of the revelation that no longer can he hide it, it turns to God for mercy. Not only that, but he finally realizes something that he didn't grasp at first. It's only you, God. Only God can blot out my transgressions. David said, I've tried, but I can't escape them. I've tried, but I can't can't get away from it. David said, he goes on in verses 2 and 3, and he said, wash me completely from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin because I acknowledge God my transgression. And then David made a very profound statement that every one of us needs to understand outside of the grace and the mercy of God. Outside of God's loving kindness and his compassion my sin is ever before me in that final statement of verse 3 David not acknowledged the truth that defined his life my sin is ever before me that phrase ever before me conveys several powerful truths first of all David's sin would always be before him. Even though David got mercy from God, even though his sins were blotted out, David in that day lived under the law. And the sad but brutal truth of the law is that his sin would always 
be in front of him. The rest of his life, all of his days, his sin was in front of him. His only hope was the sin sacrifice. But the blood of bulls and goats cannot wash away sin. So his sin would be before him covered this year by the blood of a bull. And then next year, bam, there is that sin again ever before him. And a bull would be offered and his sin would be covered. The looming guilt is there year after year after year. The condemnation was there every time he had to carry the sacrifice for sin to the temple. Every time that David selected a lamb he was reminded of the dreadful thing that he had done. He all Always, for the rest of his life bore the crushing guilt of those terrible tragic choices that he made in his life it could be rolled ahead but only in that day for one year at a time and every year David would have to face again the greatest failure of his life year after year after year David's sin was always before him. Not only was it always before him, but the unfortunate truth is that his sin was always growing. His guilt was always increasing. Every year in David's life brought new failures, new guilt that was added to the old guilt, new transgressions that compounded the old transgressions. David's sin wasn't just a static reality that was always before him. It was a dynamic and growing problem that loomed over his life. Every single year, his guilt was greater and greater. Every year, his transgression became more and more. Every year, David fell further and further short of the measure of the law of God. God and it did because he was guilty he would always be guilty his guilt was never growing his sin was never remitted it was only covered up his sin was never washed away but Anderson God just covered it for a year and then next year it had to be covered again the best that David could hope for was to simply roll his sins ahead to take the ever-growing list of things that he did wrong and of his faults and of his failures, the ever-growing evidence that demanded death under the rule of law, the best that David could ever do was just to push his punishment forward for one more year. And that's the worst truth. It's conveyed by the, pre, by, the, by the phrase, ever before me. Because ultimately, judgment is always waiting. Even if David did everything right, even if David fulfilled the entire letter of the law, he may roll his sins ahead, but the truth was always there. The inevitable. David had sinned, and nothing washed that away. Nothing took that out of his life. David realized his sin was ever before him. And sooner or later, there had to be a price that had to be paid. Sooner or later, David would have to answer for his sins. Sooner or later, the blood of Uriah would be placed fully and squarely on the shoulders of David. David's was a dreadful reality. Judgment was never satisfied. It was just rolled forward for one more year. David lived under the heavy weight of the reality that you can put a thing off and put it off and put it off. But all you're doing is prolonging the inevitable. Sooner or later, under the law, you have to answer for what you've done. Sooner or later, the sin that is ever before you is going to demand accountability. A price must be paid. The account must be settled. 
And David keeps offsetting the penalty temporarily. And he keeps pushing it ahead one year at a time. But sooner or later, David is going to have to face what he's done. His sin is ever before him. His sin looms, thank you, ahead of him all of his life. Because under the law, all the blood of the Lamb did was push it forward one more year. That's why it's important that on that wonderful day that John the Baptist stood there on the banks of the Jordan River and he lifted up his eyes and he saw Jesus coming down to the river. He uttered some of the most powerful words that have ever been written in Scripture. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, John the Baptist lifted up his eyes and saw Jesus. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Thank God for the precious blood that flowed from Calvary's tree. Jesus was the Lamb of God that came for the express purpose to take away the sins of the world. Jesus didn't come to roll them forward another year. He didn't come to just pacify judgment. He came to take away my sins. He came to take away my guilt. He came to remove that ever-present responsibility for sin from off of my shoulders. He came to take away the ever-looming ever judgment of sin. I'm glad for the Lamb of God. Thank God for the Lamb. He bore the brunt of God's wrath at Calvary. He paid the price for my sins. He did more than just cover them. He did more than just roll them ahead. He brought forgiveness. He brought remission. He brought a blood covering that would forever cover sin. He made the words of the psalmist a reality. David didn't even understand what he was writing when he said he cast my sins as far as the east is from the west. Jesus Christ made that a reality. David didn't even really understand the impact of it but Jesus made the promise real. He stood in my place. He was more than just another annual sin sacrifice. His blood was more than just the blood of bulls and of goats. He bore the wrath. He faced the judgment. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He didn't just push judgment forward for another year. He paid the price for sin. He died for your iniquities. And he established that they would never be remembered against you again. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. He didn't push him forward for a year. He washed him away. He drowned him in a sea of forgetfulness. He made a way that you can be free from the burden of your sin. You want to know what I'm most thankful for this Thanksgiving? You know what I'm most thankful for? Let me tell you, Romans 8 and 1 says it. Romans 8 and 1 is why I'm most thankful, Brother Anderson. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Are you tired of coming to church and feeling condemned? Are you tired of coming to church and feeling...
feeling the Holy Ghost move and you know it's the Holy Ghost and you feel it moving but you feel a condemnation in your spirit. Do you know why you feel that condemnation? It's because you're walking in the flesh and not in the spirit. If you'd learn to walk in the spirit, that condemnation would leave you. That condemnation would go. You can walk in the spirit because Jesus did not come to just push your sins ahead of you. Jesus did not come to just cover your sins and hide them from other people's view. Jesus came so that your sins could be completely washed away. He forgave them. He remitted them. He washed them away. They're gone in the eyes of Jesus. And when we come into his house, there is no condemnation if we walk in the spirit, if we live for God and love God and walk after his statutes and live by his law and love him according to his word. He who the son has set free, that man is free indeed. I'm free from the bondage of sin. I'm free from the guilt of sin. I'm free from the burden that I carried. Woo! Because his blood has washed it away. He set me free. See, here's what we need to understand. The phrase no condemnation includes both the sentence and the execution of guilt. The greatest reason for me to give thanks is not that he healed my body. Not that he healed my body. The greatest reason for me to give thanks is not that he provided my needs. It's not that I've got a roof over my head. It's not that I've got food on my table. It's not even. That he reached right way down. To pick me up. The greatest reason. That I have to give thanks. Is that once I was lost. Once I was helplessly bound by my sins. But Jesus set me free. He paid the price. He bore the judgment for my sin. Both the sentence and the execution of the sentence have been fully satisfied at the cross. Let me tell you what I'm thankful for this morning. I'm thankful that the blood of Jesus has done for me what the blood of bulls and goats could never do for King David. I'm thankful that my sins are not ever before me. I'm thankful that I'm not left with for fearful looking forward to the ever looming judgment of God. I'm thankful that I know that he's already paid my price. That he removed both of the sentence and the execution of the sentence. Jesus paid the price for me. It's what I'm thankful for this morning. <clears throat> Maybe you think like David did. Maybe you're here this morning and you think like David did. Maybe you think you can't escape the judgment for your sins. Maybe you think that you can mitigate the wrong that you've done by doing right. I got a friend a few years ago who was on a hunting trip in Arkansas. It was a limited draw permit hunt and it was opening morning and he killed an eight point buck. The deer was at a dead run across a field and he brought his 
45, 70 up, followed that deer, got a little bit ahead of it. Bam! Big old hunk of lead went into the side of that deer. Deer dropped, drug it out about a mile and a half or more out of the woods. By the time he finally got the deer out of the woods, it had been several hours since he killed the buck and the meat was starting to get warm. It's too warm for his comfort, so when he got to the truck, he got out his knife and a rope and a gambrel, and he hung the deer, and he started the process of skinning, and, and he began to quarter the deer so that he could put the meat on ice in a cooler and preserve it. Eight-point buck, if you've ever hunted, when any deer comes out and you've been standing in that, sitting in that stand for two or three hours, the adrenaline immediately begins to rush. And even if it's a doe, the first thing you do is bring your gun up and look at that thing in the sights and decide whether I'm going to shoot it or not. But when you pull that gun up and you look on those sights, and on the top of the head of that deer, you see that? You feel your heart pounding in your ears. We got friends, pastor church on the west side, Brother Oliver. He's got a son, Donovan. I think Donovan's eight maybe 10. I don't even know how old Donovan is. Yesterday morning, Donovan Oliver, he's 10 years old. I've been hunting since I was his age. I've never seen a 14 point buck live. Yesterday afternoon, Donovan Oliver shot a 14 point buck. And I don't mind telling you I was a little angry. potty mouth little brat still wet behind the ears <laughs> what in the world I prayed God all I want is eight I said this God I told you all I want is eight or ten points and you let that snotty nosed little brat kill a 14 point buck <laughs> but my friend was a, all you know adrenaline hits and he was excited it was a nice deer Took him two and a half, almost three hours to get it out. He was exhausted, running on adrenaline. And he forgot about the law at the time, which required in Arkansas at that time that a deer be checked before you quartered it. They changed it the next year. You can go kill them and quarter them and check them in. So he was nearly halfway done with the process when he realized that he'd failed to check the deer before he quartered it. So to make a long story short, he went ahead and finished, packed it in the cooler, iced it down, drove to the check station and rehearsed what he was going to tell him when he got there. And when he got there, there was a federal warden that was manning the checkpoint, and he told him exactly what had happened. And the federal warden signed off on his license, making him legally checked, and he chided him about his lapse in protocol. But he sent him on down the road with this warning. He said, you'd better be careful and you'd better disappear because when the state warden gets back and he finds out that I checked this deer off and you quartered it before you got it checked, he's liable to try to hunt you down. So he took off and started driving down the roads and it was not just a few minutes when he looked in his rearview mirror and the state gaiden warden's truck was bearing down on him. And he wrote him a ticket under a law that was intended to stop poachers. He wrote him a ticket under a law that was intended to provide the game warden the opportunity to ticket an individual that he caught with an unchecked deer that had been quartered for the purpose of concealing what kind of deer it was because you can only kill so many bucks and then so many does. He wrote him a ticket for quartering a deer before it's checked. But he wrote him the ticket after the deer had been legally checked by a federal warden. So there was no way for my friend to prove his case unless he perjured himself and lied and told him that he waited until afterwards. So he made up his mind that he would fight the ticket in court. The problem was... The night before the court date, the whole state was under a threat of severe ice storm, and the court was way off in the southern part of the state. So he called the game warden that he knew, and he told him the dilemma, and he explained the ticket, and he explained why he felt like he had a good case 
to fight it in court. And basically, this is what the game warden told him. The game warden said, you are right. You were not guilty of the intent of the law. You were not guilty of the spirit of the law. The law was not intended for somebody who got excited and quartered their deer before they thought. The law was intended for guys who tried to conceal a deer, not guys who drive up to the check station and make themselves known. He said the law was never intended to catch you. But the problem is, you were guilty of the letter of the law. And when you stand in that courthouse, the judge is only going to ask you one question. Did you quarter the deer before you checked it in? The circumstances aren't going to matter. All the reasoning about the spirit of the law isn't going to matter. The only thing that's going to matter is that you're going to look at that judge and you're going to say, yes, your honor, I quartered it before I checked it in. And he said, you'll be found guilty under the letter of the law. So before I go any further, I guess, the, the warden did have sympathy on him. He paid the fine in full, but they took the points off his record and he's still able to hunt. But I told all that to tell you this. In our court system, the judge is bound to interpret the law by the letter of the law. It does not matter if you have good intentions. It does not matter if there are exceptional circumstances. Guilt is not determined by the spirit of the law. Guilt is determined by the letter of the law. The truth is, by the letter of the law, we're all guilty. The Bible tells us in letter that we have all sinned and we have all fallen short of the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 3, 6 says, For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives light. The letter of the law kills. The letter of the law is all wrapped up in works. It's based on what we do. It's based on our obedience to the law. But for everything that we can do, we can't forgive ourselves. We can't remove our own guilt. We will always be guilty under the letter of the law. We will always deserve judgment because the letter kills. But the Spirit represents what only God can do. The Spirit sets us free. The Spirit sees not our guilt, but it sees our innocence. The Spirit doesn't see our fallings. It sees His supreme sacrifice. The Spirit makes His blood the issue rather than our faults the issue. The Spirit gives life and that life is abundant. The most terrible thing about sin is that the memory of it never leaves us. I can't tell you how many folks I've known that were forgiven of their sins but were never able to completely forgive themselves. It's a spiritually debilitating thing to live where King David lived. To live in that place where you never fully get the victory over your past. It's terrible to live in that place where your past faults and your past wrongs haunt you and they hold you back that place where you're constantly reminded I failed God so many times that I can't count them let me tell you a secret this morning God does not want you to live in that place your sins have been forgiven 
Your sins are under the blood of Jesus. Heaven will never remember them against you. But now the enemy, the accuser of the brethren, he makes it his business to bring those things up. He makes it his business to plant them in your way when you're coming and when you're going. He makes it his business to put stumbling blocks in your road and try to hinder your walk with God. God, but you need to look him in the eye and you need to boldly tell him, I have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. I have been forgiven by Jesus Christ. I refuse to live under the guilt and the shame of my past. If you struggle with guilt over your past, if you struggle with forgiving yourself, it's time to get victory over that. Colossians 2, 12 through 15 tells us this. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. At the cross, God has in a single stroke whipped out the whole record of everything you ever did. God blotted out the handwriting of the ordinances that were against us. Everything that hell tries to accuse you of. Everything that your enemy keeps dragging up in your life. If it's under the blood of Jesus. God doesn't even remember it. He's removed it from between you and him. And here's the wonderful truth, folks. I'm almost done. Here's the greatest reason on a Sunday morning before Thanksgiving to give thanks. The same nails that nailed Jesus to that cross nailed every one of your offenses there as well. <clears throat> and they were covered in the same blood that covers your sins and cleanses them and washes away your iniquities. Somebody said, God can't forget. But the Bible tells me that he chooses not to remember. You should never let the guilt of your past sin lord over your life. You should never let your past dictate your future. What's under the blood should be under the blood. If God forgets, then you should strive to forget. If God washes it away, If God washes it away, and I'm not saying this sacrilegiously, for God's sake, lay it down. If he washes it away, for his sake, lay it down. Because the Bible says that when we sin willfully, we crucify him anew. He is the only one that is capable of washing away every sin that you committed. He is the only one that is able to free you from the guilt of your past and the harm and the wrong that you've done. And if you choose to sin after his blood has been applied to your life, the Bible said he cringes on that cross again. They drive that nail in his hands and in his feet again. They pierce him in the side 
again. They crushed that crown of thorns on his head again. If God forgives it, then I should. Stand with me. R.A. Torrey wrote a book around the turn of the last century. In the year 1907, an entity shared a story of a particular Sunday in, in the church that he pastored in Chicago. And he said that after service, a man lingered in the sanctuary. And when R.A. Torrey went to talk to the man, the man immediately broke down. And he said, I want to be saved. I want to be saved. But he said, the man said, I have committed a sin for which there is no forgiveness. I remember my mother reading me in the Bible when I was a boy that those who committed this sin could not be saved. The preacher asked him what the sin was that he'd committed. And the man proceeded to whisper what was wrong in the eye or in the ear of the preacher. Told him what he thought he'd done that God could not forgive. And immediately R.A. Torrey turned in his Bible and he flipped to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. And he said, sir, is this the passage that your mother read? And it reads this way. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor idolaters, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And with sorrow, the man put his head down and said, yes, it's what my mama read to me. And then he asked the preacher, doesn't it say there that there's no salvation for those who do this sin? Doesn't it say there that they shall not inherit the kingdom of God? And R.A. Torrey simply responded by saying, I want you to listen to me, young man, while I read to you the very next verse. And R.A. Torrey read 1 Corinthians 6 and 12. And such were some of you. But you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All of a sudden, that man looked at R.A. Torrey and he said, does it say that? Does it really say that? R.A. Torrey just simply handed him the Bible and said, read it for yourselves. With tears in his eyes, the man read the passage, ran to the altar, and began to repent of his sins with the newfound knowledge. Brother Harper, with the newfound knowledge that once they are under the blood, they are never remembered again. Once your sins are under the blood, I don't know how God does it. I don't understand how it works. But when God puts your sins under the blood, they move from being ever before you to being put behind you. Are you sure? 
I'm positive. I'm positive. Because the New Testament writer said, there are those whose sins go before them to God. But there are men who have been washed in the blood, sanctified by His Spirit, who leave their sins behind them and they go to meet their God. I'm telling you, there is nothing that you have done that God can't wash away. There is nothing that you have done that God cannot forgive. There is no sin that you've forgive, committed that God cannot forgive. The greatest thing you could be thankful for this, this, this week, this Thanksgiving, is to make up your mind this morning that you're going to step out of your seat. You're going to come to this altar and you're going to lay every single sin that you've ever, ever committed, every wrong that you've ever done. You're going to lay your pride aside and you're going to quit worrying about who sees you and what people think about what you've done or haven't done. You're going to quit worrying because it's not about what people think and it's not about what people know. It's about what God knows. And God knows where you are. And He knows what you've done. And He knows what you're doing. And He knows your heart. And He knows the intents of your heart. And He knows your mind. And He knows He's made up His mind. That if you will give it to Him, He will forgive you. If you will lay it on the altar, He will wash it away. If you will ask Him, he will forgive you. Somebody else needs to come. Somebody else's sins are ever before you. Somebody else is fighting the guilt and the shame of having your sins in front of you. Why don't you let Jesus take them this morning? Why don't you lay them down and let God heal your spirit? Why don't you lay them down and let God heal your heart? God's in this place this morning. The Holy Ghost is here. He's here because He wants to set you free. He wants to give you a reason to be thankful this morning. He's in this place.